Hello, everyone. Welcome to What Magic Is This? A podcast about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. And for today's show, we will be continuing with the obvious themes that come with the month of October. But we will be talking today about something specifically which I don't think has been covered as a topic on any podcast before. And that is the art of nigromancy. And our guide on this journey is as well-versed as they are well-traveled in the realms of spirit and sorcery. A practical magician who is active in Obea, Solomonic Magic, and Quimbanda, as well as the author of one of my personal favorite contemporary books of sorcery, Magister Officiorum. I am so glad to finally be able to say, welcome to What Magic Is This, Julio Cesar Odi. Thank you for coming, Julio. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Julio, as I said, I've, I've talked a lot about your book on my podcast, and I had a ton of people. I think it was on an episode I done on meditation. I said, I, I, I love this book so much. And since then, they're like, when are you going to get Julio on the show? When are you going to get Julio? I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know. But finally, I was just like, it's, it's absolutely time because uh, this is something, again, I don't think anybody has really talked about in depth before. So I have to ask you, Julio. It is a term that I've used before on the podcast, but how do you personally define negromancy? I think I define it the same way that contemporary historians do, which is the, the mixture of magic with demons and magic with the dead. So, um, and I mean, I tend to have the same view. I think it's, and it's also the same view, although nobody uses that name inside any of the traditions that I'm, I'm active in, but it's, uh, it, you know, the, the art itself is the same. So, okay. yes. So, older documents will use the term necromancy to describe what you just described. So, uh, is there, in your eyes, a true difference between contemporary necromancy and contemporary necromancy? It, it, it's, a term of de- it's a term debated by historians, I know that. And I, I think that, like many other words, like like Obia itself as well. Like it, it, it's a word that no longer, the word itself means more than the word itself carries, right? So necromancy is the kind of thing that it's been used for a while to define all kinds of black magic and all kinds of magic that did uh, quote unquote an illicit uh, activities. And, and, and so I think there's little distinction in reality. I think that necromancy tends to concern itself for a long time now, we demons ended that as well. So pretty much necromancy and necromancy tends to be the same thing. But if we're going to be strict about it, of course, necromancy would be more centered around the dead and not demons. But yeah. Something that is a term that I've used before, and I did a whole episode that covered archaic forms of this, as well as the modern grimoire that everybody knows. I'm going to use the word Goetia. How does Goetia as in not the document, the Ars Goetia, but archaic Goetia, tie into something like necromancy? And, and what does Goetia mean to you, Julio, at this present moment? Like I, I, I have a bit of a controversial, I think, view of this archaic Goetia. Like I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's much of a matter of history. I think it's a matter of contemporary authors um, delving into some of this material and then believing that there might be a corpus of practice that could be called as such. I think Goetia is, again, similar to say, uh, something you could say in Brazil, we have a term called macumba, which is sorcery, right? It, it, could, it, it could summarize that as sorcery. Like it means other things, but it also means that. And, and it would be the same as saying that there is a, a thing called Macumba, and w- when in reality it, the, the word encompasses all kinds of spiritual activities undertaken by people from north to south of a country. So I, I think uh, the, the way I see this archaic issue is that we, we have this, these scant historical sources that indicate that people did this and that kind of activity in ancient Greece, but I don't think any of it could be construed as a as a one, say, you know, body of practice that could be we could refer to usefully in the practical sense of it. Of course, I mean, people nowadays tend to mine all kinds of sources for spiritual knowledge, and I think that's fine. Is but in asking me what it means to me, like I think that I know 
Ars Goetia, and I, I, I just as other historians, I'm puzzled as to why a book would be named as such, beyond the fact that it does work with demons, but I mean, same as many other arts do and aren't called Goetia. So, but archaic Goetia doesn't really mean much to me. I think up, up, when it comes to the time that maybe somebody can do some restoration based on more solid ground, then it might mean something else. But I don't really concern myself much with it. And I know very little of it as well. For sure. Yeah, it, it, it's tough. We don't really have any document of this like supposed group of people. So I understand what you're trying to say there. Very little was written as well. Right? Yeah. So I mean, yeah. so th- this isn't a, a, an organized practice. So. Yeah, we kind of just have all these people that were looking back and, and they were just being like, ah, the, this group of people that we don't really like. And we're, we, other than yeah. that, we don't have anything else. Yeah. For sure. So you have said that nigromancy is in some way tied into the evocation and uh, the interaction of demons. So <laughs> to your eyes, what is the history of how demons were conceptualized and eventually became a part of Western magic? I should probably say that I'm no historian. So uh, my, I, I have theories and I have you know, ideas about how it could have happened, but I, I don't think anything that I say in that regard should be taken as, as, as positive fact. Like I could be, well, I could be wrong, but I, I think that, that looking back at every ancient source, including the Goetia that we were just talking about when looking at the at more ancient documents like the Greek magical papyri and so on, uh, we see that working with demons or, or lower spirits, or actually spirits that weren't called demons, but they were, you know, they, they had a sim- similar characteristic, characteristic, so to speak. Uh, that's been around forever. And I think that there hasn't been a period of mankind in which that kind of work wasn't around. Like if we look even to, to Africa, uh, the, some of the more, the older practices uh, had workings with this kind of spirits not called demons, but you know, in, like in, in in every other regard, they would very much be the same thing, right? If somebody has said so, how did they be, how did they come into the Western? I, I mean, they, they came by through the same way that they came into every other practice, I think. And because what we call Western magic is really a blend of several other sources that came from, say, Near East and Babylon, and some Greece, some Egypt, and some that got formulated in Europe itself. I think it's always the demons have been the the shadow of every one of these uh, these practices that you know it, it hasn't been it's always been there, so to speak. Yeah. I love it, fantastic. So, as mentioned, you wrote one of my favorite books on contemporary magical practice called Magister Officiorum, which for folks who have no idea about this book is is a record of attaining the attention of spirits from this one grimoire that at least everybody knows. And any time that there's talk of like grimoires or books of real, in quotes, real books of, of black magic, it, it's this grimoire called the Ars Goetia, which is specifically English from the 17th century. So when did you start interacting with this grimoire and, and why this grimoire? It has been a very long time. I mean, it- if we're going to talk about technically when it first happened, I would be a teenager because I've been collecting this kind of books and working since I was very young and I'm not exactly young and now. So it's been a while. Uh, but I, I think engaging in earnest came much later to that. Like I, I, I had a period in which I did and I had a period in which I had a limited, what I now see as limited success. Like I was, I suppose fairly fairly decent at obtaining contact with these spirits, but I hadn't actually seen a manifestation of the offices, as we call them in the, in the grimoires, come to fruition in a way that actually felt satisfactory and felt real. Uh, but that came much later, and it, it, it's this is what I reference when I talk about Obia having been the source of that idea or that motivation. Uh, and by that, I don't mean that Obia is the kind of thing that does that to people in general, but mostly means that upon tread, uh, when treading on a path that somebody's due to do, then I think the other things tend to reveal themselves. And then there was a, an indication that I should return to it and explore Solomonic magic in earnest and actually uh, not under, underestimate certain things and the importance of certain, certain things. And I did that. And when I did that, then things became the thing that you can now see in the book that, you know, the, the not only life changing, but the, to put it simply, the mind blowing 
manifestations and things that I later wrote about. Uh, to be fair, though, like I think that the influence in my thought is not so much just the Argus Goetia. Like it's a fine text, but it's by no means a complete text of evocation. Um, it has been one of the influences, but if, if you look at the spirits and the in the part where I actually tell the stories about having contact with spirits, it's not only spirits from the Argus Goetia. There's a few others there, and there have been many more other spirits now since then that don't actually exist in the catalog for the Ars Goetia. But why that text? I mean, I think that the Ars Goetia is one, what it does well is that it, it, it has, the ritual itself has a very congruent body to be understood and to be done. So the evocation begins with a conjuration that, I mean, it doesn't begin with that, but I mean, the, the, the act itself begins with calling the spirit forth by divine names and by names of spirits who command that spirit and so on. And then it proceeds, and it, it proceeds to a second conjuration that it's more stern. And throughout the whole thing, it cautions you that you should succeed by this point, and you might have succeeded this point. In which case, that's it; that's the job done. So I find that not many other workings that we have access to nowadays. And though to be fair, we have access to very little of this sort of Solomonic material tra translated to English nowadays, but the, many more exist. And I suppose that within 20 years, we might be having a very different conversation about what's a good text, right? right. Uh, but, but, um, but it does do that very well. So it does structure the ritual very well. So not, re regardless of catalog pr problems or, or any other perceived flaws that it might have or real flaws that it might have, I think structurally speaking, it's a very coherent ritual for evocation. Definitely, yeah. And it, it's different than another. I've, I've heard you in other podcasts talk about uh, your your like of something like the Magical Treatise of Solomon or the Hygromantia, which is is more developed in trying to to, to evoke groups of of spirits or, or demons. The Arsgarish is very specific in the fact it's like one. It's 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 concentrating on one for the most part. Yeah, true. Yeah, it tends to be the case. Like I, I and. I think that evocation is more complicated than what even the Ars Goetia says in the sense that you will obtain one correct manifestation of a spirit. Like it tends to be, in my experience, a lot more flaky and unstable than that. And I think that, though at times, to be fair, it does tend to work well like this. But uh, it's my, I lean towards believing that anyone who has worked with the spiritual for long enough and intensely enough will know that none of this stuff is as organized as was make it out to be, as we make it out to be so so uh and it would be very great and easier if you were but it's just not so um but yeah the hygromantia i think that there, there are good aspects to it which is say the, the cardinal cardinality of evocations and the, and the and certain names of certain spirits there haven't then happened again in grimoires for a very long time but they uh they would be known by people who do work with these spirits. They're, they're two different books. And the Hygromantia has way more than just that evocation, of course. It has other straight-up fantastical things, such as I'm going to bind a spirit with simple knife sticking on a table like that, which is, like, not likely. So, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I love I love both. They're, they're really quite uh, wonderful. So we've used this word quite a bit already, but what is evocation and how does it fit within the context of Solomonic magic? As we know from what we have available now in English, it's not all of it. Like it's certainly considered, I would think so, that it's certainly considered to be the, the holy grail of Solomonic magic, but it's not all there is. Like we we find these um, these addendums of sorcery to several of these more contemporary grimoires that you know, feature, say, spells and things that one can do and perform using the names of these spirits and, and the hope that that will garner their influence and attention to attain a specific goal. Uh, so, so in fairness, I wouldn't say it's all, but it's it's most of it. And evocation is it's in, in comparison to other things. Is certainly Solomonic magic certainly isn't the only tradition that does feature evocation. There are many, many more traditions. I think one other great example is um, also published by Scarlet Imprint. Is um, I forgot the name of the author now. It's Jin Magic, Jin Sorcery, <sighs> Raim Hawadim, I think. 
I may have mispronounced his name as well, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's you know which book I'm talking about. It's yeah, just, I do. Yeah, this, oh yeah, my god, like, they back, have one book it's, about James, it's. It's so. back there. Rain Al Arim. Yep. Yes. Okay. So uh, yeah, there 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 are, there are several examples of evocation there, and uh, and likewise, you, you can see that evocation is an aspect of that magic, and I would say that Solomonic magic is similar in that regard, in, in that it's although it's a crowning ritual of it, but it's one facet of Solomonic magic. For sure. One of the things when you crack open Magister Officiorum, you say this evocation is done to visible appearance of these demons or infernal spirits. So many have the made it the idea that these spirits appear, huge air quotes, in the mind's eye. What do you, Julio, mean by visible appearance? I'm not in the habit of using words that don't mean what they, you know, what, what they supposed to mean. So when I say visible, I mean visible, really. Like I, I'm, I'm familiar with the idea that many authors have actually said that they do appear in the mind's eye. I, I, I disagree. I don't think that that is the point of evocation. Like I think that evocation is is, is something that, as we may discuss further, I think that it's it's a very difficult ritual to do. Okay, it's it's it, there are many difficult aspects to it. So uh, I think it's natural that most people who would nowadays talk about it, especially with the kinds of lives that many of us lead, which is we have jobs, we have lives, we live in a society we we can hardly isolate ourselves for nine days and and, and perform a fast and and pray nonstop and so on. Like it, this this kind of thing may be common to many people around the world, but it, it's the kind of thing that I think if you have a quote unquote, normal life, then it's difficult to do so. And I think that as a result, a lot of people who talk about evocation end up never performing evocation as it should be performed. And they uh, end up formulating these fallback theories as to what this is then, you know, and then you end up in situations like this, like, oh, it's in the mind's eye. Well, I, I, I disagree. I don't think so. I think there's a very specific point to evocation. Why, why should actually be capable of bringing the spirit about uh, which is you asserting your authority and your um, authority perhaps encompasses that, but you assert the the operator as some as a force to be feared and reckoned, which is which is what actually makes a big difference in this kind of work than everything else. Certainly, and that kind of language we'll, we're going to touch on a little bit later on down the line because some people might be like, "What? This seems really suspect." But let's talk about something else that might get people's hackles up. So, in the Ars Goetia, these things are referred to as infernal spirits, but let's just call them what they are—they're demons. So, these are the sort of things that even a seasoned magician or somebody who calls themselves a magician would shy away from. Why are they special in their own way, and what is the advantage of interacting with them, Julio? I discussed this in a previous podcast, and that was many years ago. And I, th I think actually that the Solomonic catalogs are filled with more, more than just demons. I think they have there's some of that, and, and, and they're certainly more complicated to work with. But I think that Solomonic catalogs tend to have maybe small gods and they, they, or actual gods actually, like you're talking about Baal. But they tend to have small gods, and and and, and they tend to have other kinds of spirits. And uh, some spirits are as we see in the in the in the in the offices, we see while well, the spirits is good, the spirit is good natured, which means that that would defy the notion that they were demons and so on. So, um, uh, yeah, by which I mean to say that the catalog is a more complicated mixture than just you know demons. But um, sorry, the the question was. So, what's the advantage of even even if they're called demons but don't appear to be so? People that interact, particularly through something like Solomonic magic, why? Why interact with these spirits? What's, what is the advantage of doing so as opposed to, say, bothering the angels? You've talked before about things like uh, the Swarm Book of Honorius or Liber Uratus as being somewhat more angel magic, although <laughs> there are some spirits in there. But why get a book that says these are infernal spirits or demons that you're going to be interacting with and and what would be that advantage uh, the advantage of going to that as opposed to other forms of magic well in fairness people have bothered the angels as we see in in, in several other grimoires yeah. yeah uh for sure for sure they have but uh it's might be an easy answer to say but i think that they tend to be easier to work with 
easier in the sense that obtaining an appearance from them is more or less a straight path, as per described in some grimoires. Uh, there are complications and difficulties in those steps, for sure. But they it's pretty much what it is, what one, what what you're seeing there in Yars Goisha or similar workings. That's that's what that is. So um, whereas angels and other more powerful spirits, they tend to be more complicated than that. I think there are several people who would digress on the notion that angels would be more powerful. Like I... I, my view of things in Solomonic magic tends to be more traditional in the sense that I think that they are and, uh, and experience shows that they are, but that doesn't mean necessarily that th this is only insofar as significant as shaping your practice and who you would use in a given situation. Like your theology and your own personal beliefs and how much you like this and that spirit is almost irrelevant. Like it's th this kind of knowledge mostly helps you tool your ritual to understand that if there's an angel or an, the name of an angel that could help invoking this other spirit, and that's what I'll do, and that's it. So it's a very, very practical knowledge. Yeah, it's one of those things, particularly if we're going to use the Ars Goetia as an example, where it'll mention the spirit, and these are what the spirit that that spirit is capable of doing, like showing you things about the stars, telling you more knowledge about the stars. It's like, why would I bother going yeah. to an angel about this, right? Yeah, that's the the offices are very complicated. To be honest, like I find that that tends to be the more misleading part of working with any kind of, kind of spirit actually like i the offices are written in a very fantastical manner and and they unraveling those powers is is a difficult thing to do it's a very difficult thing to do i mean to, to put it simply that if and to think logically about this that if we if you weren't the case like if the offices were absolute in in if you succeed then that's exactly what you get we would have about maybe 50 or 100 demigods living on earth by now like right. who would have cracked that and would be endowed with these fantastical powers and yet i mean i haven't seen any yet so i would venture that they don't exist so uh i think that the, the these offices are tricky like they 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 tend to be a more orientative part of grimoire in the sense that hey this spirit can more or less do these things and people when people say obviously this this is an interpretation of things that have has been offered by historians so people are more qualified than i am to say so uh but it has been said oh they can talk about the stars so they teach astronomy but that's not strictly what they teach it's mostly right. that you know they they would have some knowledge about the universe and they can you know talk about that or say even astrology per se which is in i regard as knowledge of the universe itself um yeah, I love it. No, that that's true. And I think uh, for those that are interested in this kind of magic, I would rewind what Julio just said there, because as much as we like to put things in nice little boxes in our, and immediately when you look at the Ars Goetia, it does look like, oh, this thing does this thing and this thing. But I'm going to back Julio up here and basically say, yes, this is what they say, but this definitely appeals to a more fantastical element of the grimoire itself. And a lot of times when you come knocking on the door for certain things with these spirits, you will find that that's not exactly why they're there or what they want to talk about. So is there anything you can add to that, Julio? Yeah, there's an element as well that the I haven't found, at least not in my experience or actually in the experience of anyone who shares this knowledge with me, with me through the traditions that I work in, that uh, the, the seals and their names are absolute in the sense that there's one entity that would right. respond to that. Like they, 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 similarly, perhaps to what was written in Jin Sorcery, like the, in which the Jins have tribes and they obey a tribe banner. Like it's a similar vision that I have to so many experience in that under the banner of, say, Agagis or or uh, Belial, like there is uh, a legion of spirits that you know may answer, and the the power, the capacities, and the agency of these spirits will vary. Although they would all answer for Belial, and under that name, they wouldn't be necessarily endowed to do everything that you can see in in the offices there. Uh, and I, I think it's similar to say in um, in Kimbanda, you have a I, I may be the sun or may have a given issue which the other person might have the same as me and but that does not mean that they have the same powers or the same capabilities so likewise the same thing in, in solomonic magic love it that, that's great you mentioned in magister officiorum that evocation to visual appearance is uh 
difficult to do, though it is simple in terms of the steps required. That's an actual quote from the book there. Is this merely the Solomonic method? So that's consecration, invocation, evocation, constriction, slash reception, binding, and dismissal. So is is this the steps that you 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 say is fundamental to this kind of work, which is negromancy? No, what what I mean is more like if you were if you had never seen any of this and you would read the Yersguish today, like the Joseph Pearson copy, which is an excellent translation. So if you were to read that, like if you and, and you have and you understand English, you would grasp what's right. being said there. You may not believe it, but you would grasp what it means to put on a robe, have a sword, draw a circle. Like none of this these things that we're talking about are complicated steps in terms of execution. Anybody can draw a circle on the on the, on the floor. And and if you can find a robe, you can buy a robe then you have one and so on and so forth with every other step of it. Uh, but uh, what I mean is that th- th- these steps are simple to grasp, they're simple to understand, but the execution of an entire evocation is more complicated uh, in that each of these steps is, in, is, is imbued with a lot of skill and practice and repetition that the end result would be a fruit of not only the simple instructions, but of these other hidden knowledge inside each of these steps. So if you, to put it another way with a metaphor, like if you think about javelin throwing, Olympic javelin throwing, like what happens there? You run and you throw a javelin as far as you can and it has to hit a certain record or distance. Like that in itself, if I give a javelin to a child, they will throw and they will hit at some point. Like, and it's not going to be Olympic in all likelihood, but it's what it is. So again, for you to attain that kind of result, there's lots of hidden knowledge and skill and practice hidden and embedded within each step you take and the throw and the movements and everything that yields a competitor that you would see in the Olympics. And I think likewise, in evocation like this, it, although it's simple to grasp, many of those steps, they will take repetition, they will take skill, they will take a mindset, they will take much more than what's just in the words to do. So that's what I mean. I love it. So let's concentrate on the javelin, though, to stick with that metaphor. Tools. Why is the crafting slash procuring, as well as the consecration of these tools that are listed in, say, something like the Ars Goetia, such an important element towards the, the art of negromancy? That's a very old notion, and that's a notion that's presented in every tradition of magic that I have known in my life. Like I think that we, we all take things that exist and we turn into something else through magical means and with the aid of spirits. So uh, if you look into, into African traditions and African New World traditions, you're going to find the same thing. Like You're going to find uh, exhaustive processes for making certain tools, which only up when they're made in the way in the correct way that they will have any power over spirits and it's the same thing like i think that the the, the reason why the tools are what they are it's because as per what the grimoire author or whoever wrote that particular text thinks then that's what you should do for that tool to become ordered to its own nature so it's not only a sword anymore like otherwise any sword would do and we would all have one Right. But, you know, so it, it, it is, it, it's, it's this process of ordering, of, of imbuing a, a magical power or in a representation of a bigger power that is, is as magical as the evocation itself. So, uh, and it's one thing that I think that existing and living traditions can teach people in general that you, you can't just mimic that. Because you don't understand, if you don't have the spirits for your side for making this kind of tools, then mimic, mimicry will only yield other mimicry. Like it's not going to yield the spiritual results that you will have. And but in having said that, now Solomonic tools is more complex than that because if you take two grimoires, then you may have different tools and different processes for making tools, which again is representative of, of spiritual traditions. They tend to to be distant to each other and in terms of beliefs and what one needs to do to, to do certain things. Nothing abnormal about that, but still, like, it would make one confused for sure. 
So I have to ask you, because this is something that is is quite brilliant about Magister Officiorum, and I apologize because this is not in the uh, little question form that I sent you earlier. How much would, say, to go back to, sorry, to go back to something that we, we just talked about, th- this idea of throwing the javelin, there's other things besides just the actual throwing of the javelin, but your practices, y- you talk about when you were younger, you would use Ouija boards and that you had spiritual understandings before you really cracked on with the the Ars Goetia, how important are those elements into something like Solomonic magic f- for you? Like, ha- what part did they play for you personally, Julio? As much as you can go into, you- it's a fair question. Uh, I I think for the kind of mind that I have, though, like I'm a very skeptical person. Like I'm not, I'm not a I, like I, I think even even the people who are my brothers and sisters of certain traditions, they would criticize me because I'm a, a very low faith person. As in, they, they often say, you need to have faith in that. I don't. Like, I, I, I do the workings and things that will create that kind of thing. When, when it fails, I know why it failed. It's because I didn't do what I had to do correctly. But, but uh, I think that for my mind, it was helpful going through these experiences because they, fortunately for me, they did prove in a very unequivocal way that there was a spiritual side to life right. you know because although many people may take that for granted and many people believe that because they've been told to which it's not necessarily a bad thing like you may therefore you may henceforth come to the to an experience that may evidence that but i didn't have that privilege i think i grew up in a house that was very you know atypical perhaps for brazilians in the sense that they were you know this is just dumb you know, so, and and I, I I ended up exposed to to things that contradicted that, and and I know what I saw, and I know what I witnessed, and and I was always critical in what I saw, and I thought, no, there's no way I come, I saw what I saw, so I, and I know what happened there, and if I saw that, and if I did these things, then there must be a way to to do it again. There must be a repeatability, so to speak, to this process that produces perhaps not the same results, but they will do something and uh, and that's what i kept doing for the rest of my life and then, and then things got to where they did uh but but in saying that they would help with solomonic magic not necessarily i suppose that maybe if if, if you are a curse with the same kind of mind that i am then you would perhaps benefit to see this kind of thing to have this kind of experience and certainly uh working with with that humans is a lot easier than working with these other kinds of spirits so uh I mean, sure. I mean, if if somebody has the opportunity to make that kind of thing happen, they should go ahead and do it. There's more to Ouija boards and there's more to this kind of thing than than meets the eye. Then then, then I did meet in my travels um, people who were kind enough to share uh, methods of black table magic, which is essentially um, the evocation of spirits on a table. So either with the help of a medium, a person who can embody a spirit or you know using instruments like a cup or you know, other things like that or a pen and so on and so forth and i've seen this kind of thing produce results similar to evocation so um you know th- there's more there but so so you know i i generally advise people who are serious about spirituality to, to always try things and to see what's in there because they may find something that's important for them yeah, it's it's interesting that you say that you you start from a sub, somewhat skeptical background because uh, that's something that I kind of identify with as well. It's it's one of those things. I'm not going to take people's words before trying things. Is I, I actually truly want to try things. So I think that that is definitely a um, a boon when when engaging in the, in this form of magic. Yeah, um, I, I think it was fortunate though that later what the traditions that entered my life uh, gave me an understanding of sorcery that. A magician or a sorcerer is a person who creates these things. Like that, that person, to, to, to wear that title, needs to be able to create these things. Otherwise, you're not quite there yet. Which is not to say that you're like a you're fake or anything like that. But I'm just mean that you may not have reached the point that you have been able to. I can, but there might be road ahead of you, and who knows, it might happen. But but I think that that's important. And, and I think that skeptical mindset tends to lend itself well to this kind of thing because uh, I think sorcery and, and magic and the kind of magic that we see in Yars Goetia as well, they, it, it's not the kind of magic that one does with faith. It's the kind of magic that one does with method. Right. So, yes. 
It, it fits that glove for sure. Yeah. If one was to crack a Magister Officiorum, at the very beginning of the book, and I hope I'm not giving too much away, it starts basically with you in the in the act of, of ritual, and you talk a little bit about the atmosphere around you. So let's talk about the space being the place. Why is location and timing such an important factor to negromancy? I think if you think about the act of evocation as an amulet, then that's also a helpful metaphor for an Eastern Like a, a, making an amulet is a, is a matter of conjoining several influences and aspects, including spirits, uh, to produce an effect, to produce an item that's imbued with the ability to bring certain things to a person's life. And I think that an evocation is similar in the sense that it has many components to itself. And, uh, and, and for, making, for making that amulet successfully, the amulet of evocation, you will, you will have to nail these things. Like there, at any given place, to talk specifically about place, any given place has influences that of, of its own. So regardless of whatever astrological influences may be incident at any given point in time, uh, which also will influence the ritual, but they, it tends to be the case that a place itself has its own set of spirits, of its own ecology, of the supernatural, which will influence the ritual that you're doing in a certain way. So understanding those and and, and, and perhaps what Magister Officerum suggests and other grimoires suggest as well is that you apply a reset of sorts to the environment, which is you clean, you cleanse it. Right. And upon cleansing it, then you take out all of these other unknowns from the equation, which then will allow you to be more precise with your ritual, which I found to be true. You... And, and in time, to be fair, you may build such a place that uh, is leans towards favorable at all times, which means that you're not going to have to cleanse it at every time that you perform an operation like this. Yeah. But but I think initially, if you have never performed and there's no such place in your life, then you would necessarily have to. And and it tends to be problematic because going back to what's feasible for for contemporaries contemporary people's lives. It, it, it tends to be very difficult to keep a place isolated unless you have a big house and you have or you have a decent setup for this, this sort of thing. I think that people circulating uh, and, and coming and going to a place that's going to be like evocation is going to happen tends to be one of the worst things that can happen actually because people like we're not alone like we were we're very much accompanied by several things at a given point in time and and even ourselves we tend to produce our own. Um, not to get a bit theosophical here, but we tend to produce our own, say, energy and your own influences that tend to stay in a given area and they may not be favorable, especially if you're going about your day and worrying about other things and so on. So, so that's the, the, the purpose of place is that, is really finding a, a space that's more, at least neutral yeah. to the act of evocation. Now, some grimoires like Higromantia will say you can perform this operation near a river or you can perform on a crossroad or you may perform in a yeah. say in a house or a, up a mountain river. climb up yes. a mountain and do it up on a mountain man <laughs> yeah but to, to be fair the mountain is necessary for some yeah. spirits but but yeah. but like i think more generically speaking about place like uh, it, it, it's not next to a river like it really depends on what river you're talking about it, it depends on your ability to cleanse a place that's you know like in nature which is not very easy to do so no. you, you you could you could endeavor to do it in a crossroad. And I have seen grimoires tell people, I can remember one now off the top of my head, but I have seen work say you can perform this on a crossroad. A crossroad is incredibly difficult to cleanse yeah. in that you should, you should probably not even try to do it. Like it wouldn't be helpful to do that. But, you know, such is the kind of instructions that we find in grimoires sometimes. Like they can be nonsensical, I think, or just outright unproductive. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to give away all of the uh, the wonderful contents of Magister Officiorum, but one of the things that really hit me that has basically gone into all forms of Solomonic magic that I personally practice is the role of the grimoire, where the seals and the names of the spirits to be written upon a successful evocation are to be written. So is this the same, Julio, as say like a Liber Spiritum from Agrippa's fourth book of occult philosophy? Like why, why did you see this as being central to the art of necromancy? I, I didn't actually initially. I, that this was one of the things that came up, came by with, um, with the other spiritual revelations that I had, which sent me back to Solomonic magic in that I was instructed to mind the grimoire. And the book and the making of it and i had 
read previously in, in work such as the one you cited that, oh, there is such a book and there is a preparation for a book. Like, I think if we look at um, the Sworn Book of Honoris, I think there's a prayer before that, you know, consecrates that grimoire for use. Right. And and that's not, that's that's being seen before in other workings as well. Like, I, so I knew about the notion of such a thing, but I didn't actually know about, uh, I hadn't seen anything concrete along the lines of that being a tool that would facilitate the evocation itself. Even, even though some grimoires may indicate that that's the case, I never quite believe it. So and when I got that instruction, I followed it. And it was one of the more significant discoveries that I made in that sense that um, the transformation of a simple book into a book of magic, which can itself be a tool that when open and read in a certain specific order, then it can actually be one of the main levers for invocation to work. Then, you know, that's one thing that I try to instruct in the book for other people to make. And, uh, and, and the process for creation is, uh, is surprisingly simple in that the only thing that makes it magical really is the reception of the secret seals of spirits which is the seals that they, they, they aren't in grimoires, essentially. Like you can use a grimoire seal, but the secret seal or the personal seal, or the seal, people call it personal seal. Like I don't quite like that, but it, it's a seal that will correspond to the spirit that actually manifested under the legion of, let's just say, Belial that I decided to work with. Right. Then that seal there is a seal that I can use that belongs to my person that will belong in my grimoire, and then I can use that one. So in the, in the act of receiving these seals and their names and the records of the evocation, then the book itself becomes the tool in time. Right. So when, when you say the seal, because people are going to ask, is that the same seal that is seen within the Ars Goetia, or is it something that you've received from the spirit that you were evoking itself? The, the latter case. Yeah, it, it's, it's not the seal that's in the Ars Goetia. Like I, think, I don't think there's a single seal that I can remember right now in my practice that actually is any from the Arsgo issue, any other grimoire that we have out there. Yeah. That I can remember now. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. Are you able to elucidate on the importance of ascertaining the identity of the spirits evoked? I've talked about the Solomonic Method with Alexander F. from Glitch Bottle Podcast in a podcast about a year ago, but there is the part of the process, and you say it is very important, that you you have to make sure that when something picks up to use the metaphor, the telephone metaphor, when somebody picks up the phone, that you are talking to who you're supposed to be talking to. Yes. Uh, there have been many other books that talk about that too. I think uh, one of them is the excellent book of art magic that the operators will get, question the spirit and doubt them and then send them away and then have them come back later and see if they're the same until... I can now, again, remember, I read that a while back, but uh, it's. Uh, I seem to recall that they... It, they, they did catch a few liars until they caught the right spirit. So, uh, and, and to be fair, that's an instruction that I came to receive in one of the traditions that I work in that like you will receive other spirits that are not the spirit that you're calling. So you need to question them and you need to, to query them on certain specific topics that they must know. Otherwise, they're not the kind of spirit that they're talking about. Like, so you, that is the importance really like because it, it's, it's very easy to be deceived by some other spirit that says, I am Beelzebub now, and, uh, and I will, you know, give you a lot of things and, uh, and talk about mysteries. And they may very convincingly talk about mysteries, actually. And, uh, it, and it may be difficult to do that, but it's, it's necessary. Like, uh, to, to give you another parallel, like, uh, we, in Kimbanda, there's such a thing called, uh, it's called the Ashe. Ashe is, it's, it's a word used for defining power in general. So, so spiritual power. So, uh, and an issue when he gets mounted on a when the issue mounts on a person and the person loses consciousness, they the issue creates certain capacities on your body, such as you cannot get burned anymore, and you cannot you can walk on glass without getting cut, and you can eat a rotten head of an animal and you won't throw up, and nothing like that was going to happen. So uh, there there are several things that gets done. And for a person to receive their ashes, they must prove that that spirit that who was embodied in that person is in fact an issue. And the only way for you to know that that's the case is if you pass these tests, so to speak. Right. So, uh, and, the, and the importance of these tests is really not just for other people who are around you and are part of your spiritual family, also for them, but for yourself, for you to understand that this is not anything else or any other kind of spirit that may well have embodied in you 
but it's not who they say they are and don't have the powers that they should have. So likewise, in Solomonic Magic, again, you have a situation where you may well have obtained a visible appearance of a spirit and it may well be a spirit. It may well be a spirit that has some wisdom and it has some power too, but it may not be that spirit. They may, though, be happy to be your Beelzebuth if, if you decide that you're going to accept that, but they are not anywhere close to the power of the legion of that spirit that, you know, if you were to get the correct spirit. So uh, Solomonic magic is very demanding in that sense, and I think it's rightfully so, because if you're going to really work with spirits that aren't, well, it, I was going to say lower spirits, but truth be told, that can be, a, that the same rule can apply to any kinds of spirits. Like you, you have to find a way and to ascertain that you are working with who you think you're working with. Yeah, it's part of the craft, and it, and it has to be done with uh, with cunning. One one would say, and it, each instance seems to be very different. But if, as Julio said, it, it's it's one of those things that takes skill. Like this this act, discerning discerning when spirit shows up is something that you cannot read from a book. There are certain indicators that you have to work through to to obtain these, and it's it, it's it's definitely one of those things that Julio talks about in Magister Officiorum. It may go against people's nature because. To be fair, you are you would be in a situation that's not a normal situation. You, no. and by by any stretch of the imagination, like you're not like talking to a person, and, and, and that's complicated already. But it's important in that you know, the, the correct development of something, and, the, and and even going back to the offices, like the understanding those offices may only come first of all with the truth of talking to the truthful spirit, and not with other spirits. Exactly. So you mentioned the word legion. Then let's talk about uh, this kind of thing. Much of this sort of evocation has a tinge of, I'd like to speak to the manager, please, about it. So what is the best way for listeners to conceptualize and contextualize, basically, the, the spirit's hierarchy as well as, as their authority? You use the word tribes as well, and I, I really like that word to use. There's, there's a biblical reference to, to, um, to an exorcised spirit saying that, you know, uh, we are legion for you. For we are many. This is a common passage that's been in horror movies and things like yes, that. Yes, right. So, uh, and, but I think it's one. It's a passage with a lot of wisdom. Like in in that you you you, I think it was Jesus who asked the name of the spirit, and then the spirit said, "My name is Legion. For we are many." And uh, and I think it's a, it's a cunning answer in that like if you and this is my own now interpretation of things, you could, I could give you a name, but it would be one of our voices right now speaking to you while there's like a million behind us right now. So, uh, and, and that is what I mean when I say tribe and banner, like all, all these words are not, uh, they're not exactly fitting words. I think they're like, they are human words for groups of something or, or for people. Right. And, and in this case, their spirits. So their groups tend not to work the same as ours, but, they nonetheless it, it's a useful concept to understand so uh you mentioned there's a tinge of i would like to speak to the manager what do you mean by that just that when one particularly and again i don't want to give away too much from your book but you bring up the case of of evocation of gemon or grimmery through whatever book you're using to be as a way to gain access to different spirits which seem to be quote unquote higher up in order so they seem to have some kind of a hierarchy so in the case of magister officiorum it's to have audience with gemory so they can talk to say paimon or other spirits that are higher yeah paimon would be the case with her uh, it's yeah. they, they do have a hierarchy but I, I i digress that people creating and drawing tables of spirits being one above the other spirit like i don't think it's as simple as that like i think they right. They have spirits that are more powerful than other spirits, and therefore the less powerful spirits will not necessarily revere, but they will respect the more powerful spirits. So uh, that's more or less it, my as far as my notion of hierarchy goes. Now, one of the major points of my surface your own is is explaining to people that there's such a thing that or finding the right time and place for performing invocation. It's implicit if you would succeed with uh, with Gemon or Gemoni, if you that you have already succeeded and you have done many things right. By which point, but as you will see, that these minor spirits they have limited agency in this world. But what they do have, and some of them have, is the vision of where the other ones are, 
as in, for instance, they have also a vision of the correct influences of the planets and the angels with other spirits that circulate around the Earth at any given point in time. So they can tell you exactly, well, if you were to perform the same ritual and call that spirit on the day such and such, and at the time such and such, then you would be successful. And if you were to call the same spirit, do the same thing on a different time, then most likely you wouldn't be successful. And then the reason is because there are other spirits influencing this area which you're sitting in right now that will not be helpful to you. So essentially what you're doing is you are, uh, they are clairvoyant in their own way in, in seeing where other spirits are and they can tell you these kind of secrets for you to perform the operations. All, all, all of this knowledge will in time become less relevant in that you build upon the power that you acquire in performing vocations and then things become easier so to speak yeah. they're, they're not gonna become easy i don't think ever but they will become easier and then then suddenly their role becomes an order in your life it's not so much about informing when to do what but you know they, they become something else but there, there's something else as well which is that they i think even the tooling for performing evocation may vary a lot from person to person in that you depending on certain traits of your, say, astrological, of the time when you were born and place where you were born and so on, that that may mean that you may need a more, say, martial influence for performing invocation correctly than you would need a mercurial influence, so to speak. And uh, and this kind of spirit can actually see that through you and they can help you. But not, not all spirits can see this kind of thing. So not all spirits will give you correct answers for these things. And Gemon is one spirit that, is endowed with this kind of ability. So therefore, it was a spirit that I wrote about in the book. And Paimon is 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 have his head as one of the four kings in some in Agrippa's work and and a few other grimoires. But um, re, regard that aside, uh, Paimon is in the category of spirit that is considered a king, and therefore the, his agency for for building a practice for a person is much stronger in that he can almost work as a god to say, this is what you can do, and this is what you will do, this is what has power, and this is what hasn't power. And and uh, they will speak with a lot more wisdom and power than most spirits will. So, um, and, but my opinion is that we, don't, we have far more than just four kings, so uh, he's just one of them. Got it. Fantastic. That was a wonderful answer, Julia. <laughs> There's a lot to chew on there. It's like, oh man, I'm going to have to re-listen to that as well. Fantastic. Magister Fischior also has much to chew on about the difference between intellectually comprehending this sort of magic, nigromancy, and the practical applications of actually doing the work as an individual. So for those who have never done this sort of magic, what should people keep in mind about the difference between intellectually knowing about, say, something we just talked about, intellectually knowing about the four kings and actually interacting with even one of the four kings? Consider something. like uh, It's been about 150 years or so that grimoires have been in earnest diffused in the New World. Like, can I say, I mean Brazil, I mean the Carib- Caribbean and some of the states as well and, and, and further north. What were people doing about 70 years ago when they didn't have about 40 or 50 translator grimoires? What were they doing? Were they doing it wrong? Were they, they had one grimoire that they managed to get their hands on. So it was a Cipriano, like it was, yeah. It was, it was, yeah, or it was a Dragon Rouge, or it was, you know, something like that. Look, you know, there might, there were other things that people brought over, not just these popular grimoires. They may have brought knowledge with themselves, and they may have brought personal grimoires with them. That then, and, and I have a few of those that I acquired over the years with from traditions that I've been part of. But there are other things, to be fair. But but what I'm trying to say is that you you have to consider that any time that you think that you need to take out a PhD on the history of Western magic, that People have done much with way less than what we have right now. Yeah. So, so I think that I tend to think that spiritual endeavors are, it's a very practical endeavor. I, I, I like to think that as, as, as something that has to be done to be understood. I think that you can, it, it's, it, it shouldn't be confused with knowledge what you will read in a book. Knowledge is something that can enact power. 
right? And power is, this kind of knowledge is acquired from truth discovered in contact with spirits. So that's where I see this coming from. I, I see, I see maybe what comes out of a book or an analysis of a given grimoire as something that is more like a door to potential knowledge. So, so, so if you were to use it and you were to obtain that kind of knowledge, then that knowledge would enact power, then that could be considered knowledge. Right. So, and that may come from one grimoire that you may have had your hands on. And, 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 and actually studying and trying to synthesize five plus, 10 plus grimoires may be uh, perhaps a pleasant exercise intellectually speaking, but it won't get you any closer to, to succeeding any of this. Yeah, one can definitely when, particularly when when they start to find even the Solomonic method and, and getting into this sort of magic that it's like I want to do the heptameron, I want to do this, I want to do this. It's just like s- s- slide out of the saddle, cowboy. Perhaps maybe just try poking around with one for at least a year, at least a year. What what, what would you say to something like that, or or is it one of those things where it's just like try everything? I I don't know. I think I'll be more. I wouldn't be more keen to recommend people finding one that they can resonate with and then actually putting that to serious use. And to serious use, I mean, actually, actually use it. And it's not, I don't think anyone's ready to perform invocation save perhaps for people with an immense talent that they're born with, but you can't rely on that being the case. But yeah, I think that will take more than just, oh, I tried to do this thing yesterday. And I'll try again in a month. Right. Like you, you, what you have is not a practice. You have an interest that may, in all likelihood, it's not going to pan out. Like not right. not in the way that you're reading about, at least. Like you, yeah. it may produce something, but I don't think that something is going to be what you're reading about. So, uh, so I would say finding something that people would like, and then giving that a very very serious shot in the sense that you may be willing to try several times to. To perform the fasts, to perform the isolate, to, to isolate yourself, to to you know, to, to seriously invest. Like I, 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 I'm not, these days I hate pop culture references to things, but there's that movie about the Abramelin that somebody wrote, which is not quite the Abramelin. It's not even at all the, a dark it's not song. A dark yeah. song, yeah. yeah. I mean, th- there's one observable, w- one interesting side to it, which is that look, if you want to see this happening, you're going to have to rent a house and vanish for a while yeah. right and i think that's perhaps the only one relatable part of that film that i looked at which is true and and and, and going back to gene sorcery the other book it's uh we have instructions for evocation that entail a person spending spending 40 days in a cave yeah right and uh that is certainly not easy to do so uh but many other instructions for invocation in that book entail similar recl- seclusion and mm-hmm. And fasting, which is again, fortunately, not strict fasting in the sense that you, you can eat, but you have to avoid certain types of foods. So I, I think that's a more productive endeavor than than trying to synthesize grimoires. Because to think about a different proposition, think about you trying to become a voodoo saint, like a person who is in voodoo. Like you, if you were to try and synthesize what twenty or fifty lines of voodoo are doing to find the best voodoo ever, like you're gonna get. A mess that's not going to get you anywhere. No. Right? So similarly, that's how I think about this. Fantastic. I love that. What would you recommend for people? Because we're talking about this stuff, and I know that some people are going to listen to this and just be like, absolutely not. I don't want to have any part of this. I find it interesting, but I don't want to have any part of this. And other people are going to listen to what we're talking about and be like, hell yeah, brother, I'm on board. So for the, those people, what would you recommend that they have in order or are experienced in before they get involved in this this sort of thing? I like I like starting with skepticism. I think that that is very important. I yeah, like, that, that yeah. is a good thing. That is a good yeah. thing, I think so. Uh, but I think a change of mindset is probably one important thing to do, perhaps the most important thing to do, because you you can't realistically attain something or succeed at something so advanced as evocation, expecting that that's going to happen even remotely easy. Right. It's, it's simply not going to. Like I think if you were to take other traditions 
experiences into consideration or, or the experience of people in other traditions like uh, you will rarely hear of people meeting spirits face to face in a similar way that you're reading about the invocation be it Solomonic or or Sufi or, or anything else it's like it doesn't matter like you're not going to hear that happening trivially which means which should be enough to inform anyone that uh, even for people who live that on a daily basis like for you to conduct such an operation it's 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 incredibly difficult. So I think if you were to embark on this journey with this kind of mindset, then you would be most more adequately prepared to undertake this productively. Because if you if you walk in believing that this is going to be something that's going to resolve itself in your mind's eye in a day, then you will end up embarking on something that's not evocation, that's something else entirely, and then you know. I don't think there's a likelihood you're going to see it. So I would say the mind, the skepticism, sure, and the mindset change as well. Yeah, some some different metaphysics besides that of just like materialism. I think is 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 pretty in good some, in many ways. It is. Yeah. 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 Definitely. So, how do you decide? You, I'm speaking to you specifically, Julie. How do you decide with things like steps or tools or prayers and words that are necessary to evocation within the grimoire and and what do you not because there's things i don't want to give it away there's things in magister officiorum that you're just like you don't need that right away nah. uh, <laughs> so, and for yeah. me it's just like what like I, I don't i would love to know how julio decides and how he got that information but you don't have to reveal the secrets as to how but it's just like how do you discern what uh, to keep in and what to get rid of what's in the book isn't a secret by definition like it, it, it's it's there i yeah. i wrote about the process that worked for me when I set out to do some like vocation and I was already active in other traditions and I, I did that. And that's the thing that I wrote about. So I reached that decision about the importance of certain things after a while of working with that. So it wasn't something that I just sat down and elected not to do. Right. Uh, it was more like there are many things that I did do that eventually I discarded uh, through many failures at performing vocation that I, that I then started arriving at a subset of those things which delivered it. Now, you could argue that perhaps you would have worked if I had used something else. Perhaps you would have worked sooner if I had used something else. And you might be correct about that. But I think that with with something as difficult as evocation, and the best we can do is really just say, this is what I arrived at. And, and, and given that you live in a different part of the world, being a different person and having a different routine, exactly what I wrote about may not be the thing that will work for you, but the best that anyone writing about this topic can instruct is just telling about what they did. So, and that's what's in there. So, so what do I do to decide? I use things. I use many things. Nowadays it's different because having, having work for certain spirits gives you clarity and revelation about what matters and what's not. I think if I were writing that same book nowadays, it would be a different book. Like it would I would go a bit more into certain things that I didn't go because I didn't know about them at the time. So, yeah. so yeah. Okay. The end of Magister Officiorum has you relating some of, not all, some of the experiences of, of your interactions with these, these spirits from the, the Ars Goetia. So when we say relationship with spirits, particularly after evocation, it's very personal. Having experienced it myself, it's very, very personal. But there are there some broad observations about these relationships with uh, demons or infernal spirits that you are able to share, Julio? I think there's some of them in, in the book itself in that you are um, – there are possibilities that open to a person upon having contact with certain spirits. And they – I think they will offer you to to you know like we we could uh, I mean, i'm not, not going to say like uh, we could work together but I'm, what i'm trying to say is more like if you end up having an ease at evocating a given spirit and they end up becoming a presence in your life and there's a, a an element of truth to what's instructed in many grimoires along the lines of you giving an order for the spirit to next time that i call you you would come much faster than now and that being something that they can do and and that itself could morph into a relationship such as the one that you're describing but all, all of this hinges on other things that I were just that we were just discussing about such as them being the actual spirit that they right. say they are 
then have them having proven that they have power, them having proven that they have wisdom that can actually you, know, you can act on. So um, I, I suppose this this kind of avenue is always open to people who would succeed. And uh, but I would caution against easy ways into power through the hands of these spirits because. I think even if you were to look at the sources themselves or, or to grimoires and, uh, and, and to living traditions in which they appear and to bibl biblical sources or and to sources of other holy books, you can see that they, they can be untruthful and they can mislead you at times. Mm -hmm. And that may not be something in my now, now speaking about my experience, they may not be something that they set out to do to destroy you, but, but you have to be wary of things like that, you know, presences like this in your life. I think uh, uh, even people who are in other traditions in which evocation isn't the method of communication, you would always be wise to to hear things, but to take, take caution about what you do with that information because, you know, you, you may find out the hard way that it's not necessarily how they're saying, that things are going to pan out, for instance. Yeah. yeah. But in, in answering the question, uh, relationships are always possible. Like, you may... You may you may require if that's what you're interested in. A person may go and request that from them, and then see what happens. But and what's going to happen is impossible for me to say how right. that's going to unfold. Yeah, and again, with this kind of with this sort of magic, and we talked about this in the Solomonic magic episode. It's the the, the hard invocation is is the the working that the circle, the knife, these kind of things. And then afterwards, you need to talk with the spirit, basically to say like, how do we accomplish this level of communication, or even slightly less, by better means? Am I correct in this, Julio? By better means, other than performing invocation with all these tools that you just described. Yeah, yeah. Well, if if you evocation and, and spirit work in general, actually not evocation, but working with spirits is a skill. Like it, it's a, it's something that a person gets better at if you endeavor to get better at, and if you have discipline and the mental discipline and the physical discipline and everything to, to reach it, then 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 you're gonna get better, and then things are gonna get easier, and 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 the more you build upon your successes, if you have the wisdom to build upon your successes, then. Mm -hmm. Then you will get easier. Like I, I, one of the things that I mentioned in, in the book that I didn't go much into is that the possibility of spirits like Gemon providing tools for a person to instructions on how to build tools that would make it easier for you to access a spirit such as Paimon, and that tends to happen. So they may instruct you to build. I want to say a knife could be a knife, or it could be something else. It could be an, a talisman or a ring or something, mm -hmm. in which they may say, if you were to build this ring, then this would get easier. Then you go and build a ring and then you keep going like this. And then at some point things are going to get very different for you. And, uh, but yeah, yeah. If, for anyone thinking that then this becomes limitless, I, I, I don't think it does. Like I think that it's, it's important to be careful that we live in a universe that has many, many, many influences happening upon us and upon other people at the same time. And, and I suppose the more noise you start making, the more attention you start receiving in that sense as well. And you may not be as prepared as you think of dealing with this kind of attention. So something to think about. Something to sit with for sure, everybody listening. So the listeners are going to absolutely murder me if I don't ask, but what do you think the spirits that one can evoke with these grimoires are? What are They've been contextualized as being fallen angels, the dead heroes of the past, are they actually demons? Julia, what, what do these things, or does it even matter what these things could or could not be? We, we touched earlier on that. Uh, I think that it's, I think we have, in Solomonic Magic, we have a mixture of it. And it, 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 in a way, it's unfortunate because you have a much more structured approach to evocation in, in say, Sufi, less orthodox Sufi magic, in that you have the correct tribes to work with and you have the correct names to use for each tribe, and then you will more or less climb a ladder, which, whereas with Solomonic magic, we, that's never even discussing any grimoire that I have knowledge of, at least. Like, there's no such thing about you should start with these or you should do that. Like, there's no, I've never seen it. But, but uh, they, they are really a mixed bag of, say, I wouldn't say heroes, but they, they can be dead sorcerers. They can be dead people who were very significant and very powerful with, with other spirits, and therefore having attain a different status of spirituality post-death post that then may make them something more than a human. 
we have this uh, this concept in Makaya, which is a um, uh, sorcery that hails from AD called Jab, which is a, a small demon. So to, to, to make it simpler to understand, and a Jab tends to be a person who became more than than just a person throughout through the work of certain things and through the, the influence of certain spirits. I think we have some of that too in Solomonic Magic. We have gods in Solomonic Magic as well that uh, could be very tricky to evoke and to work with. Uh, and But they are side by side with other spirits that are much lesser than they are. And there's no, no explanation as to this here you should be careful of because this one's going to be much easier. Perhaps you should order this thing up. So as I was saying, there's no such thing. But uh, they're a mixed bag of everything. There are, there are outright demons in them. I think that one such case is Malthus, that you have. Mm. It, it's, it's a very dangerous demon in, in that it's, it's a demon that tends to lie much, very powerful though. And it tends to, um, uh, back when I used to write on the internet called blogging, like we, I wrote a post <laughs> about a work that ended up, I think, in a book. Uh, I can't even remember now if I did put that in the book or not, but there is a uh, working specifically directed to, to Malthus. And, uh, and you have to understand that these demons, and they, they, tend, to be, they tend to revel in suffering and, and in, in, in people being led astray and being delayed in life. So, uh, so you know, they, they exist. I, I, I know that the contemporary view is that, oh, demons are, you know, essentially there to help you. And that's, that's a vision that actually is not even that modern. Like there's have, there have been philosophies in the past that used to say that. But what I mean to say is that I would just caution that they might be outright evil spirits. So it, one is welcome not to call them demons if a person doesn't want, but they, right. that doesn't make them not evil. So, yeah. <laughs> For sure. I bought a copy of Magister Officium from Watkins on my very first trip to London and was there right at the right as soon as I walked in the store. I was like, I heard about this book. I'm buying this book right away. And it came into my life at a period of time where I was just I I tried some kind of Enochian bullshit something, something. And I was like, this it has not worked for me. And so Magister Officium appeared at exactly the time I needed it to. But something you wrote in there hit me like a diamond bullet was this idea that when we look at specific parts of these grimoires, things like hierarchies and rulerships, which we have talked about a lot on this episode, they seem to, from first appearances, be different in some ways and then similar in other ways. But you spoke of them in Magister Officiorum as being different dialects. They seem to have similar elements and players and essence. So are you able to expand on this a bit for, for the listeners? What do you mean by a dialect? These grimoires have dialects. I think that perhaps dialects is not even the right word to qualify okay. this thing. What I mean is that, yeah, it would be a different book if I were writing nowadays for sure. <laughs> like I think that uh, people's interpretation when, when composing these things that we call grimoires nowadays, they, they may see certain hierarchies as truthful and the motivations for them to be seen that may reside entirely, not even in practice. Like it may, as, as we have indication from actual historians of magic, uh, people compose these notebooks because they compose them. Like there's no, it, 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 they, they weren't necessarily born out of a person exercising that activity. Right. And discovering that, you know, that could be the case. So who knows what the motivations were for seeing a hierarchy as shaped in a certain way or, and then a different book or a different grimoire seen this other way. I'm not sure that's what you mean, though, as I'm saying that. Well, you say that um, when there's no continuity through the grimoires through, say, something like even like the Four Kings, and I, I don't want to talk too much inside baseball here, but the Four Kings in one grimoire are mm. different than the Kings. But there seems to always be some kind of like a strange something at the top. It might be a trinity of some kind. And then underneath that, there's four or – but these the names are all switched. How they're interacted with is all different. But that seems to be indicative of some kind of a process. Yeah, and it could be. Like I think, though, that uh, they – there's not necessarily a trinity. I think if you there, – there's some of that. But I, I have seen – hierarchies of these spirits in, in new world traditions that were actually four at the top or just one at the top and then you know other spirits below them so 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 there like you know it, it's it, it's a different method and different way of thinking about these things but i think that um 
there's usefulness in seeing like cardinal kings, mm -hmm. mostly because the cardinal points is um, it is something that orients practice of spirit in many other traditions as well, besides Solomonic magic. And I think that there might be a technical factor to actually re regarding them that might influence positively the evocation. But in saying all this is that some people will say, oh, you have those four spirits as being um, cardinal kings on that grimoire, and you have a different one that says other names, but that just means that they are the same spirits with different names. Well, that may or may not be the case. I think that's a very, uh, there's, there's an easy way out solution to right. rationalizing all these things. I think that you will find that in practice, that spirits may organize themselves in a way, and I'm, I'm not trying to say that they may customize themselves to your preference, more like they may be in accordance to what you can obtain contact with, right. given your possibilities in the place where you live in and several other influences that you know, may be difficult to explain. Yeah. That's what I mean, though, that I think, I can remember now which author said that, but if the, if spirit hierarchies were that rigid, then all of this wouldn't be nowhere near as hard as it is because we would have one way of doing this stuff. Yeah. There would, perhaps by now, we would be pretty damn close to getting to, and then that would be that. Yeah, yeah. And it'd be taught in colleges. Can you imagine? Terrible, terrible. That's evocation and taught in your local college. Gross. <laughs> yeah. Over the last decade, I've seen discourse on how ugly and unbecoming it is to compel and adjure spirits, be they infernal or otherwise. So is there a retort to this sort of stance within within contemporary magic that I see coming? It's like, oh, the Ars Goetia is, is it's contemptible because you're cursing. You, they ask you to curse the spirits and you're supposed to bind them. Ew, gross. You shouldn't do that. Everything has agency and everything is glorious under the lights of God. They're all, they're all Elohim, all of this kind of stuff. Do you see a way of responding to this kind of a stance? I, nowadays, I often don't, but I, I mostly think that people can be that naive when it comes to the spiritual. I think that you, they can conduct their own spiritual practice in the way they see fit, and that's fine. Like I think that if they're doing that and they are having huge success, great. But I, I doubt so. Personally, I don't believe it. Right. So I think that you, the, first of all, the Erasguisha doesn't say that people should punish spirits. Like It, it provides you with the method for you to do that should you decide to take the evocation to that point. So that's a world of difference between saying that spirits need to be punished and and that. So uh and, and you know so, so what I'm saying, you if you look at the, the order of the conjurations, it does say that you should succeed at the first conjuration, you should succeed at the second conjuration. Def even it goes as far as saying you will definitely succeed by here. Right. And I'm talking about the Peterson translation here now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then there are several steps until you get to the point where you would, you know, get to the point where you're actually punishing spirits. Now, you, as I suggested in my own book, like, I don't think you should do that with Gamon. And the reason why I'm saying so is because you may close a door that you may not be able to open with a different spirit. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very practical reason for me to be suggesting that, not because I think that you would be evil or, you know, Gross, as you said, if you were to do it, but I'm just saying that you you need to think practically about succeeding at these things, and you would possibly be shutting yourself off to that. Now, the Ars Goetia says no such thing. You're welcome to go ahead and use the Ars Goetia and never get to the point where you have to punish spirits, and you'd be fine. Like you would, you know, if you succeed before that point, then you succeeded, and you never got to the point where you punish anything. But if he helps and you want to accept that, punishing spirits is a feature of many other living traditions out there. And for similar uh, reasons that the Ars Goetia would do. And nobody has is rallying a cry against voodoo or kimbanda or anything like that. It does happen in these traditions. People may not know because they're not part of it, but it does happen. So, so uh this, you know, the relationship between us and the spiritual is made by us. So people are welcome to go and not do it ever if they don't want to find. But I'm suggesting that there's wisdom to that and there are reasons for that. And, you know, take it if you want or not. Yeah. <laughs> Julia.
I got to ask, what do you make of all these risks in these these quick and easy, like Solomonic evocation or how to summon demon in, in 15 minutes courses and books that have been released over the last 10 years there? A, a new one seems to come every every month. What do you what do you make of them? I I have very little regard for courses on this on this on this topic, it's like especially online courses, because yeah. and the reason is because you're like, I think if you were to teach someone to do that you would have to volunteer to fast along with that person, to isolate yourself along with that person, to, to find a correct, a good place and to perform all the cleanings and to pray along with that person and to, to, to do all that you would do on your own with that other person. That would be teaching that. Right. Now, if you are now on a course and you're like just outlining methods in an online course well maybe some people like doing that more than they like reading a book and trying to think themselves right. fine you know it's, it's fine but but i would say that teaching is not that like that is just giving you a course on grimoires in general which anyone can do if you were a historian of magic who has never ever stepped into a circle before in your life you could be qualified to to lecture a course like that because you would have knowledge about what grimoire say, grimoire a says you should do what grimoire b says you should do and you could even create a synthesis of all that and you could teach a course and done right so but i think that teaching evocation and teaching about spirits in general is a much more presential matter because it's these things aren't an intellectual process they are a, a spiritual process as well as an intellectual process that you have to guide a person through and it's a big commitment and it's a difficult thing to do in itself. So that's why I don't really regard those things as valid. For sure. If somebody was to pick up the copy of the Ars Goetia that I love Peterson's, it's great. I wish more bookstores carried it, particularly any new age bookstore that you're going to find in North America. But chances are the only Ars Goetia you're going to find there is Aleister Crowley's. And it says that uh, the demons are aspect of the human mind. They're parts of the mm. human mind. So for many magicians, particularly ones who come from a more materialist bent, there's this urge to psychologize the process of obtaining and engaging in these experiences. Why would you recommend being hesitant to push on that door? Let's remember that Crowley did kind of recant that yeah that affirmation later in his life. I think yeah. when he um, when he says he received his holy guardian angel, I'm, like I'm not a Crowley fan or tell him like to say that he it did or didn't happen, but let's just say that it seems that he recanted that notion later on. Uh, I think that we have to remember as well that psychology was on the verge of what seemed to become the experience the science to explain all things of our, about our minds, right? And, yeah, yeah. and I think that people wanted to align themselves with that or to align their thinking to that. And that's when brain farts, such as what Crowley did there, like come out. Like we have other brain, brain farts nowadays, which is the historicizing of magical traditions that we know very little about, of, of whose history you know very little about. Uh, there are different things in, in, at every time in humanity there are things which are in vogue that you know people lean towards to, to try and explain why that works like I, I, I wouldn't I would caution people that it, like none of this none of this stuff was thought of as having anything to do with one's psyche for, because for starters then that, that that notion wasn't even in anyone's lips or minds so you the spirits were regarded as a real thing living outside of you with their own consciousness. And, and, and that is the reality that grimoires were composing and the magic that came before grimoires and, the, and, and many other traditions of magic and spirit in the world are all born out of a notion that the spirits exist and are out there. So in truth, I wouldn't fault Crowley for having a moment and saying that, but I would just say that, no, this, this isn't the kind of thing that applies in here. For sure. So we live in a scientific world nowadays. It's as obvious as the nose in our face, but 
there is a sort of scientific or mechanical aspect to the process of this sort of negromancy that doing the thing, even without the belief in religious precepts, can bring about results. So why do you think this is important to let information obtained by experience and trial and error take precedence? I think it's something you discover very quickly if you actually seriously endeavor to do it. Like I think, remember that we were talking about my uh, the usefulness of religion and stuff like that. I don't think anyone who who did the session that I was in that brought about the revelation that a spiritual world can be real, anyone thought they needed to believe that. Or, or, to, or as a matter of fact, I, I didn't believe that when I got into it. So, so it's not like I, I, I don't think there's any part of me that considered this might be real. Like this was interesting because I was young and, and look, why not? But, but what I'm trying to say is that this, this should be enough to say that if there are certain spiritual endeavors that can tell you that there's a materiality to it, which you will then see that that does not rely on you believing at all, right? There might be perhaps something to be said about the complete disbelief guiding your actions in so in in that you end up failing, but it's a bit of a stretch anyway to say that. I don't think any of this process depends on faith or 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 anything like that. I, I, and, I, and to be fair, when we say scientific well, that you know, evocation is, I don't think it is as scientific as it sounds, or I don't think it is as as, as repeatable as many authors have proposed. I think that successes which can come in a number of ways can be built upon and then this stuff can become easier. But I don't think there is a repeatable, transmittable process that's infallible because part of this process is the person, is the state that the of, is it's the state that the person who executes the operation finds themselves in. And it is also the place where they conduct this. And it is the time that they conduct that. So, so I think given all these variables, we're trying to get to a, to a perfect method that will never exist because the, unless you and I happen to be in the same place, and even if we were in the same place, we would still not be the same person or with similar tra- spiritual traits, perhaps. So there will be difficulties nonetheless. Okay. Something we're sitting with there for everybody, for sure. Please, everybody go back and re-listen to that. I have to ask, Julio, because we're, we're coming to the end here. Since the, we're going to use air quotes once more, grimoire renaissance of the last 20 years, where do you, as somebody who's engaged in this form of magic, where do you see this sort of magical practice negromancy going in the coming decades? I think it's, it, it's real form. It's going to exist where it has always existed, which is inside other traditions of magic that, that do practice it. And I think that we may have occurrences of people who succeeded by reading remorse and actually in, endeavoring to build something serious on top of that. But I think that the popularization of this, these things isn't going to make it easier at all. Like, and it hasn't, actually. I think that a lot of people fell into the trap of, of you know, synthesis is the key. Is the answer to this? Therefore, if I buy five or ten grimoires or synthesis grimoires out there, mine is one. To be fair, so uh, if I, if this is all I do, then I'll be fine, and I'll find a method. And uh, and I think with with more information, then its own obstacles start like the obstacles being born from the availability of, availability of materials start happening. And I think that in 20 years' time, we may have even more material than we have now, and this difficulty may increase. I think that necromancy has been, is a part of many living traditions out there nowadays that have done that in, a, in specific ways that aren't to be found in books. And if I had to hazard a guess, I think they're going to still be living there in 20 years, and for the most part. Would you say, uh, this, is a, this is a tricky question, would you say you would advise others to become parts of somewhat more living traditions now, things like Quimbanda, to to get, I'm, I just, I, I hate to like super marketize or product this kind of thing, but to get a somewhat negromantic experience, would you say, throw the grimoire away, try these other things? Would you go so far to go there? Well, 
although it's 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 a bigger endeavor, but there's something similar to be said here about this and and earlier when we were discussing about should I do an Ouija session first to see what happens, right? All of this stuff may not be in any way a preparation for a Solomonic magic or evocation at all. Like it may result in something entirely different and most likely will result in something entirely different. So so saying telling people to do go do or, or to go join one of these traditions. Like I think that it's easy to to look at outside aspects of these things and think that, oh, this is good. So I'll go and do it, right? And I think this has been one of the things that has happened the most with living traditions in our world right now, especially in the English-speaking world. Like a lot of these traditions made their travel to, um, to English-speaking mounts through books written by people who... I think they failed a lot in explaining that what they're writing about is one view of one line and one house of that given tradition. So I think even like writing a book about Kimbanda, like you're not writing a book about Kimbanda in reality. You're writing about a book about your experience with a tradition from one house. Or if you have been to more than one house, perhaps, then that's it. But in no way that represents the, the totality of that cult. So, uh, so, so this is perhaps a long form answer to saying that you would find different challenges if you were to start going into these traditions and challenges that are also very difficult. So, so to be honest, like you're, you're substituting the difficulties of evocation for different difficulties that you're going to have to deal with. I love it. So yeah, you know, yeah. choose your poison. <laughs> right. Your poison. I got to ask, and this is, uh, this is not on the question form. I'm going to put you on the spot, Julio. Um, Engaging with the the Ars Goetia, engaging in this form of, of negromancy, what has it done for you? Um, it has given me a much better life because I'm a very practical person. I went for that. Yeah. And uh, it, has, it has given me a, a, a vision of the world that I, I never had before. Like, I think I, I became a different person not because... A spirit, a spirit came and touched my head and turned me to a different person. But I think that as this, these different visions of universe and reality and and and, hum, and mankind and who are we and why stuff happens to us, it tends to change the way you see the world and the things that happen in this world. So uh, it did that for me. It did send me back to Brazil, where I am now, and uh, I don't know what else it's going to do still. But it's still doing things, and it's still taking me to places. So uh, it has perhaps the one, if I had to summarize this to one answer, it has given me a very interesting life, for sure. I love it. That's uh, that's kind of the reason that we we do this. At least uh, I can only speak for myself, but uh, I'm, I'm right there with you, Julio. My goodness, this has been a hell of an episode, and, and we're at the end here. But man, there's so much to chew on this, and I I have not been this excited to do an episode of my show in, in quite some time. And I, I love what I do, but this has been an absolute joy. Julio, I have to ask you, what what's going on? What are your current endeavors, man? So yeah, you just mentioned you're, you're back in Brazil. You have a... Um, uh, consulting, uh, magical consulting. It's called Figuera Magica. What what can people do? How can they get in contact with you for this? We call this a different thing. Like it, 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 we call it houses here, which is essentially uh, it's it's where you practice one or more traditions. So, so people around here, like we, we can find houses of different practices all over the place. Like and people will be practicing more likely Afro Brazilian religions than this. So I, I tend to be the odd one out with more than that but uh but yes i'm not the only one for sure there, there are other people uh so what what am i endeavoring like I, I was writing a book i'm pretty much not writing a book right now like i think i took a while i, I took a i took a time off from writing mostly because i i took time off from social media and social presences other than the houses and the people from brazil actually i just decided to focus my attention on the realities of spirit work that happening here which mm-hmm. is stuff that you see by going into people's houses stuff that you see by having sessions of spirit in my house that people come to and and this is the kind of stuff that i started to focus on and then that kind of took all my attention and passion which then took me away from writing but i i feel that writing is something i like to do and i might 
go back to it at some point, but I just haven't yet. I, I intended on writing a a follow up to Magic Surface Theorem, but then I figured I think that that gives people enough to start on that path. And if if people are going to get serious about this, then either it or any other one working should be enough for them to to, to do that. So I then decided not to continue on that, but I might go back to it at some point. Please do. I I I think you're a fantastic writer, Julio, and I just I can only talk for myself. I. I this book arrived at exactly when it needed to, and it was it was the kick in the ass I needed to actually try to make r- magic real for myself again. And it, I go through these periods of time when nothing seems to be real about magic, and then something happens. There's like, oh, okay, this was this was what was needed. And so I really do hope that you get uh, you get involved with uh, some more writing, but. But uh, that's Thank that's you. just me. That's just me. I, I think uh, Magister Officiorum is, is truly one of the greatest books uh, that we have for something very specific. I wouldn't I wouldn't just throw this book at oh you you're interested in magic here's Magister Officiorum. Sure. But yeah. but for something as specific as Solomonic magic um, and grimoires, this is this is about as good as it gets these days. And so thank you so much for writing in. I really hope you write something uh, something more. But uh, how can people uh, get into contact with you through? So what what is a uh, Figuera Magic? Uh, you, you you've got this website up right now yeah it's a it's the website for my house i mostly I, I keep it open because the spirits that i work with they like working and having agency in this world so okay. i pretty much just people contact me to book i need such and such done and for such and such to happen or they might have questions about look i have done this this and that and i need a reading on what where to go next and it varies. Like I, I don't do that for a living, and I choose not to because I, like I, I go through periods that I don't have much patience to, to do it. Like I, right. I, I like working for like with the spiritual families that I have, and I like working with them, and I, and that keeps me very busy. So there are times that I just take time off from figure magic. I don't do anything there, and then I come back to it, and I'm back on on you know taking requests for things. But mostly, that's that's what happens there. So uh, if, if people want to reach me for it, that's where they, they should reach me. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh man. So I, I have to ask, uh, what's what's next? What 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 are you doing? Are you just hunkering down, just to, just concentrating on things? The people need to know what's what's going on. What's yeah, going, it, what, is there anything that's next for you? <laughs> There's not much next. I'm, I'm pretty much in the in the next right now, which is nice. like I said, just just working with my uh, with the spiritual families, and there's there's so much that we do all the time. That is, there's so many activities that take so much of my energy and my time, and but I also I think they enrich me a lot in understanding more and more about this this topic. So it's pretty much what I'm doing right now without thinking about a next. I'll be in Brazil for the foreseeable future and. And I don't know, that's going to be it until something like a lightning hits again and who knows what else happens. I will have links to Figuera Magica as well as the Instagram account for Figuera Magica up on the show notes to this specific episode at whatmagicisthis.com. There you can also find my Instagram account as well as my Facebook account and my Twitter account. I'm fairly active on Twitter. I just kind of share weird, silly stuff there. I don't really share my opinion for the most part. And I'm trying to get a little bit more in-depth than, I guess, uh, using Instagram more. It's where all the kids are these days. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to be hip. I'm trying to be cool. And I'm trying to do some stuff on Instagram. But uh, I find I find it tough. I'll just say that. But I'm I'm trying. And trying is indeed the most important thing. So all of those links can be found at whatmagicisthis.com as well. Do you like what I'm doing here on the show and you'd like to support me in some way, shape, or form? Well, now you can. And there are three ways I talk about them every bloody episode that I do. Let's talk about them once again. So the very first way that I'm going to share is the best way of supporting what I do. And that is through Patreon, Patreon patreon.com slash what magic is this or head to what magic is this.com and find any number of the patreon links there so you like what magic is this the podcast you know the thing you're listening to right now would you like to have another podcast well guess what if you join my patreon you can basically have that and videos i've got so much stuff 
on my Patreon. You want episodes on certain gods and deities and saints? I've got those. Do you want to know how I practice magic in my day-to-day life or what I would do if I had a day off and wanted to do some magic? I've got that there as well. Do you want to learn more about this book we talked about in this episode, The Hygromantia? I have a full episode on that. I've got episodes on books I think you should buy. I've got so much stuff. I'm not joking. My Patreon is basically a different podcast and it is only seven bucks a month. That's seven dollars American. That is a small bag of cashews. That is, I don't know, two packs of rolling papers? Who knows? I don't smoke weed, so I don't know, but it uh, could be. Oh shit, is, am I going to get this podcast banned? Uh, I meant smoking tobacco. Rolling papers for smoking tobacco. A few of those, like little pack things, zigzags or whatever they're called. Well, that's seven bucks. It's so cheap. And you basically get a different podcast as well as videos, as well as polls to vote on what gets covered on my podcast, as well as what I do on my Patreon account. There's so much stuff there. It is so cheap. Everybody else is raising their prices these days. I'm not. I want I want you to be able to come and take part and listen to this stuff because I truly believe it is my best stuff. And if I sound desperate while I'm talking to you now, the reason is, is that I'm doing my best work. I mean, I love this podcast. This thing that I do is great, but you really don't get to see me shine unless you jump on the Patreon. That's where all of my best things are. And uh, at this point, there's about 350 people taking part. Let's make it 650 people. I want to see you come on down. Please support what I do because I love this as a job. This is what I want to do as my job for at least a couple of years, you know? And I can't do that unless I have your support. So please find your way to supporting me on Patreon. I would greatly appreciate it. Seven bucks a month. That's it. That's all. And it gives you so much. So much. Anyhow, if you don't want to support through the Patreon, hop on to PayPal. Go to my website. There's all these PayPal links there. You can donate five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, any amount, um, hopefully more than a dollar. If it's like 50 cents, haha, <laughs> funny, good for you. But also like, what am I going to do with 50 cents? You know, I can't even pay for a load of laundry with that. I can't even use a payphone. What are payphones? Ah, uh, Them's were the days, weren't they? Anyhow, (laughs) PayPal, if you donate through there, it all goes back into helping run the show for hosting, for paying for new equipment. This, I'm using new equipment right now. It's great. But donating through PayPal just basically goes right back into making this podcast run. And uh, I'd love to see your support. If not through the Patreon, then through the uh, the PayPal. And the, the, the other way of showing the support is wearing some support. That's through buying some of my merch. And there's about 11 designs there. I just put out a spooky special Halloween design for, for this month. It's, it's really wonderful. I'm using a little image from one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, you want to learn more about that book? Join the Patreon. But all I'm going to say is that I don't make a ton of money. If you buy my uh, if you buy my merchandise, I, I appreciate it. I love it. I love it. Some people uh, just showed me some photos of them wearing my stuff, and I was like, "Fuck yeah, that's awesome! It's great!" So I love seeing that kind of thing. There's not just clothes. I've got tote bags. There's uh, wall hangings. There's mouse pads. I think no wait, phone cases, not mouse pads. That'd be pretty cool. I'd get one of those. Um, unfortunately, uh, the notebooks are no longer available, but hopefully they will be back some point next year because the notebooks are were seriously my favorite. I love my notebooks. They were fantastic. I wish that the notebooks were available for uh, for this new design I put up um, with uh, for the Halloween of 2023. Anyhow, there's tons of stuff on the merchandise side of things. Grab yourself it, put it on, send me a picture. I would love to see it. Uh, but it also, you know, it's it's it's. A little bit of money goes my way, not a ton, but I still love seeing people in my stuff. It's it's wacky, and I will have known that I've truly made it when I'm walking around wearing one of my own shirts because uh, I am truly my greatest customer. Uh, I love my shirts, and somebody recognizes and is like, "Oh yeah, I like that podcast," and I'll be like, "Cool, me too," in that Tony Hawk esque kind of way, and uh, then I will walk away and cancel the podcast. I'll I'll just do a mic drop. No more What Magic Is This? Just kidding. Um, There will be plenty more What Magic Is This? But again, I cannot do it with I don't have your financial support. And the best way of doing that is most likely and definitely through the Patreon. Patreon.com slash What Magic Is This? Seven bucks a month. So much stuff. Please join there or uh, help me out through some merch or through PayPal. But all of these things are available at whatmagicisthis.com. Dot com. See you there. Have a click and uh, click around. There's some great stuff there, like show notes as well. Oh, Julio, I've 
I've absolutely loved having you on the show here. And I would really hope that if sometime in the future I'd ask you to come back on the show, you'd be uh, you'd be willing to jump back on and, and have another chin wag with me because I've I've had an absolute blast. For sure. It was a good talk. Thank you so much, Julian. That's the show. Everybody, come on back to What Magic Is This, where we'll talk about more of this black-handled, crazy, weird, visible, insane stuff we like to call magic and witchcraft and the occult. But until then, I want each and every one of you to stay healthy, to stay hopeful, and to stay luminous. Until next time, everybody, ta-ta for now. Bye-bye.